After weight training, we did push-ups in a smaller circle. Each of us with a partner, ready to help as the numbers increased. Fingers spread, feet together, head up, body straight, elbows back, eyes open, mind alert. Inhale down, exhale up. Sometimes 25, sometimes 50, sometimes even 100. On this day in week number six, we did 500 push-ups. And we took a short break, changed our formation, and bowed in for two hours of martial arts training. In this, our morning session, we practiced a highly structured style, probably influenced by Japanese Shotokan, but still uniquely Burmese. Our teacher worked all night selling milk in the market. He slept a few hours and then came to train with us and teach. When we tried to pay him, he refused, saying it was his duty and honor to serve our school. The French philosopher Pascal once wrote, justice without power is inefficient. Power without justice is tyranny. Justice without power is opposed because there are always wicked men. Power without justice is soon questioned. Justice and power must therefore be brought together so that whatever is powerful may be just and whatever is just may be powerful. Martial arts are personal manifestations of power. Perfected with nobility and wisdom, they allow us to defend against aggression and to restore harmony. We trained without anger into the sweltering heat and beyond our fatigue, reaching within for the perfect movement that could awaken us back to the barracks, wash our clothes, bathe, clean our blisters, and go to lunch. Breakfast was always meager, usually a glass of tea and some bread. For lunch there was rice, vegetables, and fish or chicken. We bought soda cans from the market, removed the tops, and made cups for our tea. Everything was rationed, but there was enough, and we were satisfied. An hour after lunch was given to recreation. Some students disappeared into their rooms, and others filled the yard with quiet laughter. Morning training was tough, but we were beyond soreness and fatigue. The afternoon brought several hours of classroom training. There was some theory throughout the course, but the emphasis was always on practical teaching and leadership training. Managers, we said, do things right. Leaders do the right thing. Each student presented a class. These, I thought to myself, are teachers, filled with honesty and love, blessed with humility, and protected from a world that measures its worth by the distance it can separate itself from its own spiritual essence. We in the West, with our technological power, and these are brothers and sisters from remote villages on the other side of the world with their peace and quiet wisdom, faces in a golden mirror. In late afternoon, we returned to the training hall for another form of Burmese martial arts. As in the morning system, the magic of the weapons is in the circles they create, and the perfection of the circles is found in the harmony of parts that makes the body into a synchronized and fluid force. It is the dance of the warrior, mastered by those who can discover the unity within their own diversity. There is a story of two men who meet on a narrow bridge suspended over a deep gorge between two mountains. One is young and carries weapons, the other is a monk. Go back and let me pass, the young man demands. Can't you see I'm a warrior? The monk refuses, saying he too had once been a warrior. The young man grows angry, a bird flies overhead. The warrior screams, and the bird stops in flight, falling without life onto the jagged rocks below. The old man smiles, inhales deeply, and makes a most beautiful sound that vibrates into the heavens. The bird shakes, comes to life, and flies away. The young man bows deeply and retreats so the monk can pass. The night before graduation, we leave our campus for a banquet at the Fulbright House. 
It will be our last evening together. They have been away from their families and villages for almost two months. And they are anxious to return home. But it will be difficult to leave. Bonds have been formed. And there is much more to learn. We are simply out of time. Nothing to do but celebrate our school, its students, and its teachers. Some reminisce. Others reflect in silence, listening to the sweet memories that emerge when personal desire is sacrificed for a noble purpose. We had changed, stronger and more disciplined, and we felt humble and privileged that heaven had given us this opportunity to grow. There was also laughter to remind us that our efforts were clumsy and we had far to go before reaching perfection. Soon the evening was over. Nothing left to do but say thanks. Thanks to Uang Din, Director General of the Sports and Physical Education Department of Burma, the American Embassy, and my brothers and sisters of the Nine Mile School who guided me into and through their world. Thanks to my driver, Kotin Sui, and to Sir Edward Rainey, my translator, confidant, and friend. Five years have passed, but it's all still a clear memory. Pourquoi, the child from a nearby village who stayed each day with our cooks and called me uncle. The journalists who came to investigate our school and the concepts it taught. How strange it must have seemed to them, the extraordinary cleanliness, discipline, and revolutionary simplicity of our methods. Life, death, mind, matter, time, and space. When the earth dream is over, we'll have only our memories, tendencies, insights, and wisdom to carry us on into eternity. We all realize in our hearts that the body is the temple within which these treasures are kept. And perfection of the human form in service to our nation, our world, and our creator is the ultimate goal of education. The problem then is simple, but the solution complex. How do we find the self-discipline to live happily with little and work for the good of others? Where is that quiet place within? that demands nothing more than divine silence. In a world that pulls us relentlessly toward impermanent material wealth and power, where is the courage to turn away and seek a road that will lead each of us onward through our own solitary journey to that moment where we stand without fear, looking squarely into the golden mirrors that are everywhere around us and within us, waiting to be found?